Welcome, everyone. I'm here with Wes Oaks, uh, a horror and science fiction writer. Um, Wes, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Um, you know, where you grew up and kind of your your life story and go as long as you as long as you feel comfortable going. Well, as 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 if people don't know me already, but there's probably one or two out there. So um, I'm that four year old who was um, who is uh, kicked out of every single school in the school system in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and had to go to a one room schoolhouse because I was so messed up in the head. Um, it didn't get much better over the years, but um, I eventually meandered my way to Tennessee where I grew up, um, Eastern Tennessee, as a matter of fact, Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I went to college for a couple of times um, and, and both the college and I decided that I wasn't quite ready for, for college. And uh, um, so I joined the army and, and I've been in the military in one form or fashion for the last 35 years now. Um, when I turned 30, I started to write. Well, that's not true. When I was seven, I wrote my first short story called What Became of Charlie? It was published in the Panther Press, which was the little school newspaper in second or third grade. I think it was second grade. And it was the only time in the history of that school that the PTA recalled the paper because um, it was a morality tale. Is what became of Charlie? Well, he was eaten by a bear because he took a shortcut, um, and his mom told him not to take a, take a shortcut. I thought it was a good story. I guess the problem was out of the five pages, three of the pages described how he was eaten by a bear. So the second graders didn't really appreciate, and their parents didn't really appreciate the detail that I went into on that. So um, having been censored at the age of seven, I was mortally wounded emotionally until I was 30. And then I started writing again. And um, it wasn't until I was 33, I think, that I finally uh, was published because I insisted on only being published in pro markets. So mm. it made it really hard, um, but I had to get better faster. Um, uh, and uh, it took me about three years and 42 rejections to, to sell my first short story. You know, and um, that's how you now know me, Sean, because I, I've written a couple of short stories for you. And that's right. I, and I really like the short story uh, the very best as a format. Um, that said, I have over 35 novels that have been published over the years as well to include like um, SEAL Team 666 and, um, and Grunt Life. And most recently, A Hole in the World, which is um, um, basically imagine every single fairy that lives in England. And I'm talking about the ones in the trees in the forest, not the ones in the pubs of the discos. Um, every single fairy in England, right, has some kind of automatic weapon and, it's, and is protecting the country from bad fairies. So, And where are the bad fairies coming from? The bad fairies are are are, uh, are the Fomorians who are trying to retake um, retake. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the the ancient Irish uh, Fomorians from the the tw- they come in, they come in during the twilight times of twilight during the uh, solstice, right? They do, they do, and they've decided that now's the time um, because what I've done is I went I went around and I made sure that that I had dryads who who basically were protecting England in these concentric circles. Right. And mm-hmm. the problem is, is they killed off two of the dryads. So half of England now is unprotected. So the, so the Fomorians are like, hey, dryads gone. It's our turn. What, when does that come out? That actually came out. Um, OK, it already came out. It came out in COVID. But but like a lot of things that happened in COVID, you know, nobody knows about it. Um, uh, it came out in November last year um, in paperback from Solaris. And um, it stars Preacher's Daughter, who is one of the main characters from my Burning Sky duology. Um, um, my, my contractors who went to Afghanistan and, and uh, accidentally bumped into a Zoroastrian um, demigod. So, um, well, that's where you would meet them, either there or Iran, right? <laughs> I know, I know. I just hate that when it happens. It's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, Uhura Mazda. And, uh, let's see, who's the other guy? There's, there's Uhura mm-hmm. Mazda, that's yeah. a good guy, and then there's uh, Fuse with an A. Yeah, Ahaman, Ahaman or something. It does, and and uh, one of one of the reasons I like I like 
adding a lot of religion to my books is because um, I'm able to do a lot of research and, and, um, you know, I have a master of fine arts and creative writing, and I would love to get a PhD in history or something like that only because I love the research aspect of it. I love finding out new facts, taking a, taking a armful of facts and then throwing them on the paper and creating a story, whether or not it's fiction, nonfiction, narrative or whatever, just so that um, people can learn and be excited about something or at least as, as excited as I get. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to rewind a little earlier in your conversation because I'm curious about something. So, so your first short story, where did you sell it to? Which, and what, and what was it? What was it about? So my first sh- short story was called Puddle Jumper and it was sold to Mind Mayor's magazine back in 1998. Um, out of Kansas City, it was one of the, it was a, it was a pro rate magazine, which was three cents a word at the time. Uh-huh. And it was a stapled magazine that, you know, you had to, you had to <laughs> mail out, get a copy of. And um, it was about, um, you know how when you look at puddles, like in the city, and there are different colors in it, which is coming from the oil. The oil, yeah. Well, what if those different colors are actually an entity in those puddles? And, and if, and if you're able to, you can make those entities come alive. And so, and so it's about the idea that all the puddles that you see the colors in actually contain these entities. So that's fascinating. So, so fast forward to your first novel. How did you, how did you move from that short story to your first novel? Like, I, I, you know, how did you sell it? And how, you know, how well, many short stories did you write between then? Just a sure, sense sure. So I tried to write the novel first because, you know, everybody can write the great American novel, right? I mean, who needs to write short stories? <laughs> and then I realized I really couldn't write. So I figured, well, I just write a short story. It's shorter. I can get better faster. Um, and then I found out how hard it really is to write a short story, you know, because you have to condense everything and still have a three-act structure and still have character arcs. And, and you know, you still have to have a lot of different things. And, um I am not necessarily a believer in Chekhov's gun, but I'm a believer in Hemingway's iceberg, which means that um, if I have a gun in the first act, I don't have to use a gun in the second act, right? Or the third act. That's Chekhov. Hemingway says you're going to have the gun because he's a soldier. And that just means he's a soldier. You never have to use it. It just have to be, has to be there. And the person... And, and it's always going to be a threat throughout it. And if you never use it and it's still a threat by the end of the story, then you've done a really good job. So um, um, having to learn all these different things like that and then apply them was very hard. Um, and I think I had about 30 published stories before I, I finally um, um, decided to write my first novel. And it took me two and a half years to write it. And um, I really didn't know who to submit it to. Um, at the time, the small presses were doing great. Um, so I sold it to Delirium Books. And um, De- Leisure Books was doing paper, mass market paperbacks at the time. But they were only paying 2500 bucks a, a book, yeah. which, which, you know, is criminal. It's just absolutely criminal because um, all the other publishers were paying twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a book. Are they still paying that kind of money for new new writers? uh, Leisure ended up going bankrupt. But what they did is I I, I truly believe they brought, they brought the payment level down. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And, and us authors are still trying to recover from it and get back to where we were in the eighties and nineties. So I refused to be a part of that. And what I did is uh, the small press I made three times more money selling to the small press than I did um, Leisure Books. The only problem was is only 326 copies of the book were sold because it was small press, right? Limited edition and and whatever. Yet it still won the Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel. So um, at least those who read it thought it was really good. Um, It's since been published in mass market trade paperback and it was out for several different for several years and i pulled it because i want to re-release it one of these days um probably um the 20th anniversary edition because i'm going to have a sequel to it as well okay all right well that that was definitely okay 
called Scarecrow Gods. Scarecrow Gods? Okay, but but it, so it's no longer available right now because you want to re-release it. Um, no, it's it's no longer available in, unless you get it through eBay. All right, another completely random question, but it'll make sense when I ask it. the The weapon, the blade behind you, what is that? Oh, this. So I collect blades. I love blades. Um, this was at an art show, and it was an artist uh, um, who wanted to create a Babylonian sword out of pure copper. Um, and he did, and this is, and this is um, very heavy, but it's well balanced. It has a wooden, it's it's wooden here, um, and is very sharp, as you can as you can tell. Um, um, and he had never made a blade before, ever, and this was his very first one. And and I just had to have it. I thought it was just beautiful. It was great. It's wonderful. So. And it's based um, in a Babylonian design, or it is. It is. Any history behind that? Like, no. He just he just found the design, and he was an artist. He said, "I'm going to do this." And I said, "Wow, you did an awesome job, man!" You know, that's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool. Um, okay, so who would you consider your influences as a writer? Oh, I mean, just I mean, there's the obvious. I mean, well. I guess that's why. So I, I never really read horror novels until I became a horror author. I didn't even know I was a horror author until I was told I was writing horror. Um, yeah. I just thought I was an author. Um, and because, because I was writing horror, I said, well, I better join the Horror Writers Association because <laughs> I'm a joiner. <laughs> Hence 35 years in the military. Um, uh, and I mean, both my parents were college or my, or my dad was a college English professor. My mom was a high school English teacher. So all the books I had, I had all the classics. So I grew up on the classics. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I read Tolkien when I was 10. Um, I suddenly got sick for a week so I could read the whole trilogy, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on page two. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, um, and, you know, Heinlein and Asimov and, and, and certainly Ray Bradbury and Lynn Carter. Um, but as an adult, I've grown, I've grown and changed in my attitude a little bit to where I really like Cormac McCarthy. Um, mm -hmm. I like his man versus nature um, theme that he carries along in everything as unforgiving as it might be. And, um, and Mirakami, uh, I love Mirakami from Japan. I, I think, I think he's just wonderful. If I could, if I could do a combination of those two, like, like be half of one and half of the other and, and do that. I think that'd be the perfect book for me. Isn't Cormac McCarthy coming out with two more books? He is. Um, he is coming out with two more books. Uh, I think they come out in June. One is um, the first one comes out and then the second one comes out almost the same time. And they're meant to be slip case together. And the second one is a prequel to the first one. Interesting. How long do you think he's been sitting on those? I don't know. I mean, he certainly he certainly has to write, be able to write fast since he uses the punctuation. So, yeah, that's that, that's that's right. Which which book is your favorite of his? Um, the Crossing, which is which mm. is the second book of his Pretty Horses series, right? His Plane series, I guess, actually. Um, um, the final scene from the crossing, it, you know, the main character comes back from trying to find somebody, comes back to Mexico and just kind of comes back to America and just kind of kneels down the middle of the street and just looks at the sky and kind of is like, why, why? And, and, you know, he's unforgiving of, um, uh, Cormac is, um, I thought, I thought the movie, um, What's that? It's called not called the attorney. It's called darn it. It's Timothy Oliphant and Cameron Diaz and Anthony Bardeen and a whole bunch of other great actors were in this movie. And Cormac wrote the screenplay for it. And um, and um, it's not No Country for Old Men, is it? No, no, no. It's a, it's another one okay. that he wrote the book for. He wrote a screenplay for this, and uh, I actually bought the screenplay as well as the movie. But the thing is, is is I see the movie. 
is out and I know exactly how it's going to end. Of course, it ends terribly. <laughs> and, and, right. and people are surprised. I'm like, you don't know Cormac McCarthy then because he, right. he says man versus nature. Man cannot overcome nature, period, ever, even the nature of himself. He's incapable of doing that. And so clearly I'm, I like the journey there, not the ending, because, you know, you, you know what the ending is going to be. But, but you know, it's the, it's the journey that he takes somebody through, the absolute hell that he takes a character through to get there, you know? Well, well even in Blood Meridian, with the, just the iconic character of the judge, it's almost like it's kind of – I don't know if that's how I would imagine Satan is, but – it's it's kind of this iconic character that represents evil, but you kind of there's something appealing about this horrible person, right? There's just wisdom there, and it's 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 really it, it's even hard to grasp when you think about it yourself. It's just like why why are there certain aspects of this character that one can be drawn to? So I don't know. I, that was the first book of his I, I read because after about two thousand one. He came out with the, with the New York Times list of the best 100 books of the last 30 years, right? And Blood Beridi was number one. And I said, whoa, well, I've never heard of this. And as, a, as an English teacher, an English major, I really need to know why this is so important. So I read it and was pretty well blown away by it, you know. It's as, it's as horrific as, as any horror novel, and it's as dark fantasy as Lord of the Rings, you know. Yeah. Well, especially his description of landscapes and, mm-hmm. and how it interacts with, um, you know, man and all that good stuff. Anyway. Okay. Back to you. Sorry. <laughs> what, if, if someone, if someone's un, were to be, un, like, if someone is unfamiliar with the, your work, where would you have them start? What book? Well, it would, ha- it would, it would be whether or not they want to read um, um, military science fiction, military horror, um, whether they want to read um, like Dan Brown esque fiction, because um, mm-hmm. um, I mean I, I've 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 done a lot of it all. I mean, um, Seven Bucks Production and Dwayne Johnson still are shopping around um, Seal Team Six Six Six, so they they still want to make that into a movie. Um, um, I've heard that they've made some uh, some decisions about some of the actors, et cetera, but I can't talk about Fight Club, so I won't talk about it. Um, uh, I have some other some other stuff in the works with Hollywood. Um, I do have a new novel coming out later this year called Red Unicorn, which mm-hmm. um, is coming out from Athon Books, um, which is actually an ebook only publisher, um, but they do a great job, they pay a lot of money. And um, um, this is a book that, was I call it my COVID book because I wrote it during COVID when, when nothing else is happening. I wasn't going to work and it takes place in, um, did you ever read in Patagonia by Bruce Chatwin? I have not. Pretty famous. And it's, it's a, it's a travel log and it goes along and in the 1970s, a guy backpacking through Patagonia and you're like, okay, cool, cool. Mm-hmm. I want to go there. Cool. And then you get to the last 20 pages and he started talking about unicorns and giants and sorcerers and cannibalism and, and, um, and ritual sacrifice and all this other stuff. And I'm like, what? Flip, flip, flip. Is this the same book? So that made me want to research that whole area that he was talking about because yeah. Even Magellan's map of that area said here there'd be giants, and there, and there, and he drew a picture of giants on this one area. And um, and the way that I sold this book is is I said, I said, what if unicorns really exist, but they're not your daughter's unicorn? They eat people, right? right? And and the guy said sold, sold, absolutely sold. Do you have giant? Do you have giants in there? I have giants in Bone Rush. Okay. Um, uh, and, 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 and that one came out from Simon Schuster and that's, and that's where I did three years of research, biblical research, um, looking for evidence of giants in, in the Bible and found out where they took the word out of it. Um, um, about 50 AD, they removed the word 
giant from the Bible, and they and they replaced it with um, with the word for messenger, which they then replaced with the word for angel. So um, there were no angels in the original Bible, but it looked but it sounded better because if there were no angels in the original Bible, all you would have is a burning bush and a guy who could part water. So so they needed a lot more magic. So what they did is they created angels instead of and they got rid of all the giants. My question was, why would you get rid of the giants so as you tried to hide them? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, this this interview might take a, a strange turn. Just stick with me on this one. All right. I'm going to ask a few questions related to exactly this. So I was talking to uh, DJ Butler, who's also an author in this anthology, and he has a series called Witchy War. Um where he brings in a lot of North American mythology. And one of the things that he brings in is the Siteka. Are you familiar with the, the redheaded giants in uh, Lovelock Cave? Well, actually, it's not just Lovelock Cave. Every major religion has evidence of red-haired giants in their history to include New Zealand, Fiji, Tahiti, Papua New Guinea, all this stuff. They all these places where a red haired person should never exist, because if you believe in evolution, which I do mm-hmm. evolutionarily, they, they could never have been born there. They would have had to right. come from somewhere else. And and 3000 years ago, who was traveling from from the British Isles to, I don't know, Fiji? Not many people. Right. All right, so here's here's where it takes a really weird turn. So there's a, I, I'm just going to be very clear. I do not believe this story because I think it's so insane that. Um, but there's, are you familiar? Having been to Afghanistan, or actually, what, around what time were you in Afghanistan? Were you there okay. anywhere? I was there in 2013 and 2017. Okay, so you you may or may not have heard this this you're tale. About the pterodactyl, or are you ter- talking about the giant? I'm talking about the giant of Kandahar. Are you familiar yeah, with this? I'm, All right, I'm, so I'm assuming it's bullshit, but but it's an interesting. I mean, do you? I mean, have you heard any of these stories? Well, let me let me just let me just point this out to you. In the 1800s, it was very, it was very frequent to have talk about giants in the newspaper. Um, it was all the time. Like every other issue of the New York Times had had just stories about giants in them. The Smithsonian had such a huge giant collection. Um, it it took over um, several different football fields until 1918 when they destroyed it all. Is this like the mounds, the, like the mounds that they've been finding in the East and things like that, where they well, this is, would this show is up? Every, everything that they've collected over like a several hundred year period went, went into the Smithsonian. They're like, oh, look at our giant exhibit. It's a great exhibit. What? We have to destroy it. Why? Don't ask questions. Destroy it. And suddenly... Since when does the Smithsonian destroy things? Never. It's not part of their charter. But they, but, I mean, did they legitimately destroy this stuff or is this they, a. They, they, no, they legitimately destroyed it. There's, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there saying and showing they destroyed it to include the newspaper said that, oh, on this day, the Smithsonian destroyed all their bones of really giants. News at 11. So do you have any, you have any theories or rationale for what 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 the heck's going on with this stuff well if you read my book all the major governments of the world exist and um gosh who is that author he has a he has a french name but he wrote science fiction author i I read his i read his books a couple years ago um but he he posited um that a race had put these these giant more like more like um, robots into the, into the ground, right? And and you pull out the robots, and immediately people are going to begin worship, worshiping them because right away you now have have a weapon better than anybody else's weapon, right? You have a giant, and it's kind of like in Dungeons and Dragons when whenever a dragon appears, you have to roll for awe, right? Um, to see if somebody has if if they're just transfixed. That's that's what's positive about 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 giants is that is that they could be mistaken for God or a God because they are so huge. I mean, look at the way 
when somebody who a, a pro basketball player walks into a room, every single eye goes to that person because he's mm-hmm. six foot 10, he's seven feet tall. And you're just like, wow, that's amazing. Now, now what if somebody walks in the room who's 30 feet tall? Yeah, that would only come up to their knee. It's only natural to treat that person like a deity. So, so the idea is, is, is if you want to have governments that work, you want to have societies that are in control, you can't have people who are 30 feet tall walking around. So, but, but we don't, right? But, but they're finding bodies that suggest that they're, I don't know, maybe 10, 10, 12 feet tall. Why would, why would, if that's the case and they're no longer around, why would they try to hide that evidence? Well, who's to say that they're no longer around? Who's to say that they're not just mm-hmm. being kept? They might just be what? Kept. Kept. Huh. Or, or, or intentionally hidden. And have you heard this giant of Kandahar story in Afghanistan? But ha- have you heard it from like, like the internet or have you heard when you were over in Afghanistan, did, did guys? I heard it both. And what do the guys in Afghanistan say? Do they think it's real or? <clears throat> so, so the, so the locals think it's real. The, um, the shooters I talked to think it's bullshit. Yeah. And, I mean, do the locals think it's real because they think it's real or are the locals also bullshit. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay. All right. Sorry. I told you, I told you I was going to take it, take you for a little, little ride. So we'll, yeah. we'll get back on, on track. I thought it was, um, I definitely learned more from that than than I was I was expecting. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell me about uh, what what contemporary writers today do. You, I mean, aside from Cormac McCarthy, which we already talked about, would you recommend, particularly in the horror genre? And then, yeah, let's just stick to the horror genre for for now. Well, um, my, right now, my two favorite my my three favorite horror authors or horror slash dark fantasy are probably Victor Laval, mm-hmm. Stephen Graham Jones, and um, gosh, there's there's quite a few. Um, those two right now. I mean, when whenever whenever they write something, I put down whatever I'm reading. And I and I and I go and read theirs, straight up. Um, uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of good up and comers coming around. Um, I've been paying attention to them. Um, uh, I mean, I'm I'm part of the original cabal, so so myself and Brian Keane and John Urban mm-hmm. Sick, a lot of folks. You know, we started together writing, and we both have achieved different levels of success as we're going along. Um, but now there's, there's a lot of good work, you know, currently being done. Um, what, what I enjoy, so I teach college online right now as a side hustle, um, because I, I like teaching and, um, and they pay me. Um, and one of the courses I teach is a third year course in, called context in publishing, which is how to submit a query letter and a marketing plan and all this other stuff. And, and I really enjoy doing that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks coming around who, who are, who are, you know, pretty amazing. And um, not just in the horror field, but, you know, in, in many different writing fields. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's exciting to see somebody who hasn't written anything um, gosh, I sound like an old fogey now. Um, who hasn't written anything suddenly writes something and achieves success. I love that mm-hmm. when that happens, you know, because I've won, I've won my awards, I've, I've, I've done my stuff, you know, so I'm good. I mean, I mean, you know, just just keep paying me and and let me write more books. So I'm happy. Um, I don't need to win anything or, or do anything because I've, I've won those, but I like to see new people come out and just disappear out of nowhere. And suddenly you're like, wow, who's this guy? Um, right. Probably my favorite book of the last 20 years is called um, A Little Life. 
um, um, which was by Hana Yanagihara. Mm -hmm. It was her second book. And it was just about five friends growing up in, in New York City. But, but the friendship rotated around this one young man who was very terribly sexually abused when he was a kid. And, and he kind of, everybody grows up around him and he still doesn't quite, you know, grow up. And, and it's just her writing about this, this friendship that's, you know, pretty incredible, which, which, you know, I don't cry often when I read books, but I cried when I read that book. So. All right. Well, that's, I think that's a a fair answer. Uh, Tell me a little bit. Now you have a story that appears in weird world war Mm four called a day in the life of a suicide geomancer, which I think is an amazing title, right? Uh, Without, without kind of spoiling it, uh, you know, give the audience kind of a a teaser or taste of, of what to expect. Well, my people are from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, Mm -hmm. um, My, my great, great grandfather was called King of the Woods because he, he made, he was in charge of all the wood for the Homestead gold mine where they make the gold. So all the woods that propped up all the tunnels, everything, he 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 was in charge of that. So hence King of the Woods. Um, and uh, and I have a lot of family through there. My the, the the family name there is Estes. So so everything from Estes Park to Estes Trucking, you know, every everything, you know, that's the rich side of the family. We're just the poor side. And uh, and uh, so I like to set a lot of things there when I, when I don't know where to set something because there's so much history I can draw upon, especially the Native Americans, which, which you, you know, you notice I, I did. And what I want to do is I want to take the idea of what if during the MAGA revolution, um, magic returned to earth somehow and everybody had their own different types of magic. And of course, because, because Indians are so close to nature, I made them geomancers because they're able to, you know, to actually talk to the rock and talk and, and convince the rocks to do things for them and everything like that. And, um, and imagine if you will, that, that, you know, the MAGA crew is trying to make sure that, you know, they make a, America white again. So they want to get rid of the Indians, right? So right. Um, it's just a matter of having been been to Afghanistan and seen suicide bombers and hearing suicide bombers and and going to places where where they had just killed themselves or being protected by these T walls, you know, you're very aware that people get so desperate and they get so turned around in their heads sometimes that that they're willing to strap something down that kills them as long as they can kill somebody else and i wanted to try and normalize that idea and and create amongst the indians a need to um protect their own territory by becoming suicide geomancers and and as as anybody who will read the story, they don't explode like they have TNT going around them. Something else happens. Something else mm-hmm. a lot more brilliant, um, pun intended. Yeah, literally, right. Literally. All right. Um, and then I think we have about you know, a few minutes left. What advice would you give to new writers? Well, I'd say two things. First, write. Just write all the time. Just write, 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 write. You got to write. You have to write all the time. And B, decide what kind of writer you want to be. Um, there's a lot of folks who who just, they can't wait. Um, they don't want to go the traditional way for whatever reason. Uh, they want to self-publish, which is fine. I, I, have, I have zero problem with that. What I do have a problem with is I have a problem with people who um, don't edit because it's their calling card. So, so right. your first book is your calling card and it's, it hasn't been edited or your cousin edited or your mother edited or somebody on the internet with a high school degree did the edits. Well, there are folks with high school degrees who can edit, 
but they're not as 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 frequent as you would think, right? right. Um, um, I would say somebody needs to have some pretty good credentials to be able to edit something tomorrow. Because I've had I've had people in different publishing houses say, "Oh well, I'll I'll go ahead and edit your work," and I'll say, "What are your bona fides?" And they'll tell me, "I said no." you can't edit my stuff. I need someone else to edit my stuff because right. you'll make the same mistakes I'll make, right? I need somebody better than us to edit my work. Um, somebody who understands some of these nuances that as a product of the tenancy education system that I, I'm still struggling with, right? Um, uh, so it goes back to deciding what type of writer you wanna be known as. And if you do wanna self-publish, fine. But make sure that your work is solid, because what I get when I when, when I go through a, a traditional publisher is I get seven edits hmm. by seven different people. That's good. I mean, it makes me look good because I'll tell you what, the first thing I submit to them is nowhere near the last thing that comes out. Right. And that includes right. my short stories. You know, when I when I submit to you. I get edits back and I don't feel bad about them. I'm like, sure, absolutely. Check, 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 check. Yeah, I'm always a little nervous sometimes um, sending it out because it's a it's a it's a fine art because there's uh, most of the authors in this anthology are extremely accomplished authors, and you don't want to screw up the magic, right? You want to try to uh, uh, you use kind of Occam's razor, right? You don't want to do too much, just enough so they don't screw it up. But even then, um, editors will miss stuff too. I'll give you an example. There's another author that the copy editor caught something, and I was like, "Thank God, we both missed." Like he had a he had the name of a creature in there that was a you know it, it turned out to have been like a transformer, right? <laughs> And we were like, good catch, good catch. We'll rename it something else. But, exactly. Yeah. So um, anyway, I appreciate your time, um, Weston. And uh, I look forward to this later on when I have more time. Yeah, definitely. But I appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for spending some time with me. No, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that.